start with our presentation. All right. So today's presentation is promoting independent, or well, today's conference is promoting independence for life. And we are really excited that you could join us. Um, our presenter today is Melissa Keys. She is the Executive Director for Indiana Disability Rights. If you would like to register for any of our other conference sessions, you can go to our website at www.dsindiana.org and go to the calendar of events and the annual conference. I want to say thank you to our sponsors about Special Kids, Family Voices Indiana, Mass Mutual Midwest and Gordon Homes, and Shepherds College. We're going to watch a short clip from one of our sponsors about Special Kids. My name is Sherry Moore, and I'm a parent liaison with About Special Kids. My name is Michelle Bickle, and I'm a parent liaison with About Special Kids. Parent liaisons have many roles, but one main objective, helping children with special needs live better lives by educating, empowering, and connecting their families. The very heart of our organization is built on the fact that each parent liaison is parenting a child with special needs. We educate families on a variety of topics, including special education, future planning, and healthcare financing. We strive to make every family feel heard, understood, and most importantly, we walk alongside them and teach them to navigate the maze of special needs parenting for themselves. All with the hope that we're empowering them to be the best advocate for their child. Thank you for sharing us with us. Up until we met you, we didn't know such a great organization existed. As future educators, the information you shared was priceless because you're not able to help families if you don't know what's available to them. Your passion is evident, your goals remain the same. As teachers, we feel comfortable referring a family to ask. The staff are experienced and can truly feel the pain of a family in need of support. At first, all I ever did was cry when I called ASK, but our parent liaison has helped bring us emotional peace of mind. ASK parent liaisons are unbiased and know intimately the role a parent plays with a special needs child. They listen, they're a voice of reason, they can help you find answers. I felt so lost. I feel so much better now about everything. My name is Kathy Berman and I am the Director of Community Relations for About Special Kids. I began with About Special Kids as a parent liaison and was able to work directly with our families in Indiana. And here, I really learned the value of our parent-to-parent -parent peer support. We are committed to providing the resources that empower families of children with disabilities and mental health concerns. ASK is committed to providing the resources vital to empowering families so that children with disabilities and mental health needs have an equal opportunity to thrive. All right, you can learn more about ASK and about all of our exhibitors by visiting our virtual exhibit hall at www.dsindiana.org forward slash virtual slash exhibit slash hall. So definitely go and check those out. In addition to contact information, uh, most of our organizations who are exhibiting have also shared short video clips where you can learn more about their organization. And if you wanna know more about Down Syndrome Indiana, you can find us online at dsindiana.org. So we're going to go ahead now and hand things over to our presenter, Melissa Keys. She's gonna to talk to us about what to know about supported decision-making and other options. So Melissa, I will let you take over. Great. You guys can watch me fumble with technology for a second as I work to share my screen. There we go. Can everybody see that okay? Like a thumbs up? Great. Okay. That's great. Melissa, can I jump in really quickly before you yes. go? Um, folks, if you guys have questions for Melissa, we're going to save those until the end, but you are welcome to chat or to type those in the chat section if you'd like. Um, that way you don't forget and we'll read through those questions when we get to the end of the presentation, okay? All right. So, uh, good new afternoon. Um, my name is Melissa Keys. I'm the Executive Director for Indiana Disability Rights. I have a master's degree in clinical psychology with a focus on developmental disabilities and serious mental illness, and then a law degree with a focus on um, basically legalese and table banging. So, between them, I have um, this area pretty much covered, uh, including crushing student loan debt. So, um, 
Today, I am going to cover some basics on decision making, and then we'll focus on options that are available to assist adults with decision making, specifically spending some time on supported decision making. And then we'll talk through how to support someone to determine which option might be um, the best for them. And then I'll give an example using my friend Jamie Beck. And then finally, we'll end with how you can help make sure the people in your life are receiving the help that they need in the least restrictive manner possible. We make hundreds, if not thousands, of decisions every day. Um, what to eat, what to wear, whether to answer a snarky email with an equally snarky email. And the decisions that we make, they really range in their complexity and the time and the mental resources that it takes to make them. Um, so for example, the time and energy that it takes for you to decide what to eat for breakfast is a lot different than the time that it takes for you to make a bigger decision like where to move to or whether to take a new job. But regardless of the type of decision that we make, the process is still the same. It involves understanding the issue, determining the options and consequences, gathering good information about Evaluating those options, making to do whatever we need in order for us to feel comfortable in making an informed choice. And we're empowered to make those choices and have those choices respected. That's part of the natural human experience revolving around decision making. Now, we have all had experiences, even as adults, where someone has made a choice for, you, for us. You know, for example, um, you want Mexican for dinner, but your partner orders Chinese food. Even these small choices, when we feel like we haven't been heard or that our choice hasn't been respected, it can make us feel really frustrated. So then think about the big decisions in your life, what job you have, where you live, how you spend your free time, who you spend your free time with. And imagine how it might feel to not be able to make choices about those important areas of your life and to not have input. So one of the things that I like to start out this conversation with is thinking about how do you like to make decisions? There are so many different categories of decision-making styles. Um, you may find that there's one or two that, you, that really speak to you or that is kind of your natural default when you're making decisions. Um, and you'll find that for certain decisions, you kind of use one, one style and for another, you use another style. Um, but you can use all kinds of different strategies in different contexts. So let's talk about some common decision-making styles. There's the analytical, um, my fellow pro-con list makers, where you know logic and data rule the day, right? Um, show me the data, show me the science, show me the, um, the, the consumer-rated reviews, that type of thing. There's intuitive, there, there's the gut feeling, the spontaneous decision-making, you know, I just feel that this is the right way to go. There's information seeking, what do the experts say? Consensus seeking, where you're going to ask friends and family, they're not necessarily experts, but you're going to look to see um, what do they say. And then there's passive decision making. The universe will guide me to the right decision, right? And then if all else fails, this is always another way to try. Um, but what we're really talking about when we're talking about decision making is self-determination, right? Self-determination is the ability to have that control and that direction over your life. So think for a minute, why is self-determination important to you? Why is it important for you to be able to make your own decisions? Because guess what? Those same reasons why it's important to you is the same reasons why it's important to people with disabilities and older adults experiencing conditions of aging. It's the bedrock of what makes us human and we should really try to help support and encourage someone's self-determination as possible. And there's a growing body of research about the benefits of supporting self-determination. For example, people who report having more self-determination, more control over their life have been um, shown to have improved psychological health, better adjustment, um, better quality of life, more employment and community integration, increased health, welfare, and safety. On the other hand, a lack of self-determination or, or feeling unable to control or um, uh, have input on your life has resulted in some negative effects in the research. Um, experiencing low self-esteem, passivity, feelings of inadequacy. Um, it can have significant negative impact on physical and mental health. There's a um, 
a principle called learned helplessness, where if you stop having the ability to make decisions or when your decisions are ignored or don't seem to have an impact on your environment, you stop making decisions altogether. And then when you're presented with an opportunity to make a decision, you kind of freeze and don't make a decision at all. That's It's a concept called learned helplessness. And that has also been uh, shown to be um, associated with a feeling of lack of control in, um, in our lives, right? So it's really important that we help support as much self-determination as possible. Um, and I'm sure many of us have been in the scenario where we've been in a meeting and someone has said, you know, oh, once your child turns 18, you have to get guardianship or else you won't be able to participate in education decision-making, um, medical decision-making, you won't be able to help them with their finances, the list goes on and on. It happens a lot. Um, but with very, very limited exceptions, very limited exceptions, there are no services, supports, or benefits that require someone to be under guardianship in order to access them. Um, I wanna make sure everyone is aware that there are options other than guardianship to help support people um, as they are learning to make decisions themselves. Um, now, don't get me wrong, guardianship is definitely, it's a necessary tool, that's why we have it. It's part of the entire spectrum of supports that we have available. But for those who are just getting guardianship to be able to participate in a loved one's life, there are other less intrusive ways. And we're gonna talk about some of those uh, today. So again, our goal here is really to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to participate, make decisions about their life to the greatest extent possible and in the least restrictive manner possible. And for many of you, that concept is not unfamiliar. It's the same concept that we take to education and services and supports. Again, we wanna, we wanna employ the least restrictive option possible in order to help someone um, make the decisions themselves. And I wanna talk briefly about this issue of capacity because from a legal perspective, that is um, what determines whether or not somebody goes under guardianship. And there's you know, all kinds of different legal standards for capacity. Um, and it's important to note that capacity really exists on a spectrum, right? Um, whether or not someone has capacity can be determined by a number of factors, including uh, the situation that they're being faced with, the complexity of the issue, um, as well as internal and external factors, um, time of day, physiological state, whether they're currently experiencing active symptoms of their um, of their uh, disease or disorder. And for anyone who's ever gone grocery shopping while hungry, you understand that you make a lot of different choices than you do when you're not hungry, right? As someone who has eaten cake for dinner, I can attest to that. Timing of day is also really important. So, you know, you ask me a question before 8 a.m., you're going to get a completely different answer than you do uh, if you talk to me at 10 o'clock at night, which is kind of when, when my brain is really active and I'm able to do my best work, right? And it also relates to the person. Their alertness may change based on when and what type of medication they've, they've had, how much sleep they had the night before, um, whether or not they are, uh, you know, season uh, can affect somebody's decision-making ability. Capacity can also change over time based on skill acquisition. The more you learn and practice a skill, the better you are at it. And the same is true for decision-making, right? Um, and here's kind of an example. So I have a driver's license. And this means that the state of Indiana has said, I have the basic capacity to drive a car. In order to demonstrate that capacity, I didn't need to prove that I know everything about how a car engine worked. Um, I didn't need to drive like Danica Patrick around the, the speedway. I just needed to meet those minimum requirements to show that I could drive, right? Now, um, my driving skills have for the most part gotten better than they were at 16, right? So when I first started driving, my skills weren't as good as they are now. And there's also been a lot of advances in technology that have made it easier and safer to drive, right? There's cars that beep when you start to drift out of lanes. There's cars that can automatically back you up in parallel park. Um, but even within that, even with increases in technology and increases in skill over time, my ability to drive, my capacity to drive fluctuates over time. Um, driving late at night in bad weather, my kids are screaming in the back wanting me to open up snacks and change the station. It's much different, my skills are much different than when I'm driving uh, Sunday afternoon, I'm going to target Beyonce's on the radio and I'm living my best life, right? But the state of Indiana hasn't put restrictions on my ability to drive. They haven't said, you know, you can only drive to target when Beyonce's on the radio. I think that would be a fantastic addition to my life, but unfortunately this is where we are, we are right now. They've also said, you know, you don't need to build a, a transmission 
to be able to have that capacity to drive. It's understood that I can seek help and assistance and accommodations for those issues that are outside my wheelhouse, like when my, my check engine light comes on. It's not expected that I know how to um, address whatever the problem is, but it's expected that I'm gonna reach out to my support system, my mechanic, uh, a garage, maybe a family member who knows more about this stuff and use them as a support to help me get my car fixed and back up and running, right? But the same, unfortunately, isn't always true for decision making. Oftentimes, um, people with disabilities have to prove that they can make decisions covering a wide variety of areas and complexity at all times and under many circumstances in order to maintain or regain their ability to make decisions independently. And so the point is, when we really talk about capacity, we need to think of it as a spectrum, not just a yes or no, keeping in mind all of the different factors that can go into deciding whether or not someone has capacity, right? So um, I wanna talk about some of the different options for how we can help support people. Keep in mind, a lot of these tools can be used in combination. These aren't all the tools. These are just um, some of the more common ones, um, but they, they can really be individualized to support a person's strengths and needs. For those of you who, like me, are visual learners, this is what I call the spectrum of assistance. Um, just to orient you going from the least restrictive to the, at the top to the uh, most restrictive at the bottom. The green categories are things that you can really move into and out of as the person needs. Um, these are ways to help fill the gaps and try and help support somebody to live independently with you know, some um, functional skills, that type of thing. The yellow category are uh, things that you really should consult with a professional in order to get set up. These are things like agency agreements. It could be setting up trust accounts, um, certain types of bank accounts, that type of thing. And then the red category are things that you really do need a court involvement and um, likely representation by an attorney in order to get um, to make sure that they are in full compliance with the law. Um, so let's first talk about some inter interdependence or some technology ways to help fill the gaps in someone's needs with minimal involvement. This can be either formal or informal services. And creativity is really key here. It's anything that can be done with minimal involvement or intrusion. And here's kind of an example. So my friend Jamie moved from Richmond to Muncie and she had to learn how to navigate public transportation. So instead of putting in her service plan, you know, Jamie's going to memorize the bus schedule with 80% accuracy over a two week period, Jamie learned how to navigate using Pokemon Go. That was something that really spoke to her, that really helped her figure out how the city was laid out and how the roads all interacted and where she was um, to learn how the maps worked. Some other options, if you're looking at things like finances, there's, you know, you can set up automatic bill pay, direct deposit, there's specialized credit cards that can limit both amount and store locations. So someone still has the freedom. Um, there's an example, uh, we had a client who was very into building model airplanes. And if he had his choice, he would spend all of his money on model airplanes. Um, what we were able to do is set up a specialized credit card so that he could buy one model airplane um, a month to work on. So he was still able to have that independence to, um, to do what he wanted to do without the risk of spending all of his money on, on, um, on a hobby instead of you know, his bills. There's joint bank accounts, but I will say that there's um, different rules that govern joint bank accounts. So if you are going that route, you do want to speak with a financial advisor or the bank to understand what the specific rules are and who has access to the money. Um, because again, with joint bank accounts, anybody who's on that account has access and ownership rights of the full account so they can easily um, transfer money, take money out. So you want to be very cautious when you're, when you're looking at joint bank accounts. There's statement sharing where somebody can authorize another person to look at their monthly statement or receive copies of their monthly statement. There's different types of budgeting tools, um, some more complex than others, um, but things that will allow somebody to uh, have a little bit more independence and skill building when it comes to budgeting and finances. Um, when we think about independent living skills, there's grocery and meal delivery services. Um, there's mail assistance where someone will open up all the mail, toss all the junk, uh, and then send you uh, scanned copies of the important things that you need to help or that you need to pay attention to. This can be helpful for people who have a hard time attending to, is this a bill? Is this something that I need to focus on? Um, 
and it can also help, you know, that, that mail can be forwarded to somebody who's helping manage their, their bills so that bills don't get lost. Um, there's all kinds of smart technology. There's, you know, ways to turn lights on and off remotely, open garage doors, lock and unlock doors. There's fridges that will order groceries for you when you're running low on things. There's all kinds of ways um, ranging in expense and um, technological ability that you need to do. There's calendars, phone apps, friends and family who will, you know, hey, a, a neighbor will friendly reminder and say, hey, you know, it's, it's time to mow your lawn. It's getting a little big. Um, there's all kinds of ways that you can help support somebody to uh, live in more independently. When you're talking about healthcare, there's medication packaging and delivery so somebody doesn't have to be responsible for sorting all their medication. There's smart medication dispensers to make sure that they're not taking more medication than they need. There's healthcare tracking apps and journals. Um, there's a HIPAA release to allow somebody to come and participate in meetings and, and look at medical records. Um, there's in the realm of education, there's planners, both electronic and hard copy. There's tutors, peer models. There's um, ways to adapt learning strategies to post-school life. So if you find something, oh, this really worked in the classroom, how can we adapt it to um, secondary education or employment context or independent living context? There's, there's all kinds of tools um, and supports to help support that. So next, we're going to focus on that yellow category. These are things that may need, uh, you should really consult with a professional to help draft a review. And I want to start off briefly with this definition of least res less restrictive alternatives that's now in Indiana law. Um, and this basically, uh, it's an approach to meeting a person's needs that restricts fewer rights of the person than would the appointment of a guardian. And that includes um, supported decision-making agreements, the appropriate technological assistance, and some of the things that we just talked about could be an appointment of a representative payee or a healthcare representative, or the creation of a power of attorney. And um, Indiana also now has a definition for supported decision-making. And so supported decision-making really refers to the process of supporting and accommodating an adult in the decision-making process to make communicate and effectuate life decisions without impeding the self-determination of an adult, right? What lawyer came up with that? Um, actually, so this definition is based off of similar definitions used by the National Resource Center for Supported Decision Making as well as several other states. But so what does that mean in plain language? In its most basic understanding, supported decision making is a way to accommodate that decision making process that we talked about. So just as you understand glasses are a way to accommodate vision or a wheelchair is a way to accommodate somebody's mobility needs, supported decision making is a way to accommodate that decision making process. And in it, people who need support making decisions choose, appropriately named supporters. These are generally trusted friends or family members or caregivers to help them through that decision-making process that we talked about earlier in the areas of their life that they've identified or in a way that they want that help to be given. So with supported decision-making, the person retains all the decision-making authority. They get to make the decision themselves. So it's really a way to increase that empowerment and assert self-determination for those who may just need a little bit of assistance with that decision-making process. So when we talk about the formalization of supported decision-making, what we generally mean is writing down that person's plan into a document called a supported decision-making agreement. And we'll touch on that briefly in a moment. And these agreements, uh, they can be changed as needed. They don't require a court to get involved. Um, and here's kind of an example. So the other day, my husband let me know that he and some of the other dads in the neighborhood were gonna start a bike gang, like bicycles, not motorcycles, which is a very suburban dad thing to do. And he asked me the all important question, should I wear a helmet when we go on our bike ride? My immediate mom response was, um, yeah, the risk of traumatic brain injury compared to you know, not looking cool in front of your dad friends um, is you know, a no brainer, no pun intended. We talked about you know, the pros and cons, potential consequences, the I told you so's he would hear from me if he did in fact fall off his bike. But ultimately he made the decision, um, the unwise decision in my opinion, not to wear a helmet not the safest choice, not the choice I would have made, but it was his choice nonetheless. And as adults, we get to make those decisions, even bad decisions, all the time, and those decisions are respected. That's an example of supported decision-making. He used me as a supporter, and that's the cool thing about supported decision-making. It's what a lot of us do already. It's how most of us make major and sometimes even minor decisions, right? 
Now, obviously riding a bike without a helmet is not the same as whether to get a potentially life-saving medical treatment, but no matter what that decision is or how much support the person's needs or the type of support that they need, it's really much better to support them to help them make the decision themselves instead of making a decision for them, right? And so people often ask me, well, what are some examples? Show me how supported decision-making works, right? And this is really difficult because it can really be anything. But just to give you guys some examples, if, if somebody has a hard time understanding the issue, we're not all doctors, right? And so, you know, if I go into a doctor's office and they're using big words and they're talking about risk of surgery and side effects and all this stuff, it can become very confusing. So help me understand in English what they're talking about. Help me break it down if the doctor or the banker or the service provider isn't explaining it in a way that makes sense to me. Help me understand what it is they're trying to say, right? Help me understand the issue I'm dealing with. Determining options and consequences. Help me see the big picture. If you know that my ultimate goal in life is to get a community-based job, how does this decision fit with that ultimate goal, right? Gathering information. Help me write out what questions I'm gonna to need to ask. Help me figure out what are good sources of information as I try to move forward in making my decision. Um, evaluating those options. Help me make a pro-con list. Help me express my values, right? Help me understand um, how the different choices fit into my overall uh, needs or desires. Making a choice. Help me get unstuck. There's been a, a, a fair amount of research that suggests that People with uh, disabilities, those who are on the autism spectrum or those who have intellectual or developmental disabilities or in some cases serious mental illness, report feeling stuck in a situation where they're being forced to make a decision in the immediate, um, you know, hey, doctor says you gotta do this treatment or this treatment, make a decision. A lot of times people report feeling stuck. So um, a way to support them might be help me get unstuck. If you know that, that one of the ways that I like to get unstuck is, is going for a walk. Say, hey doc, we're gonna go for a walk. We'll come back, we'll let you know our choice. Or we'll give you a call later after we've had a chance to talk about it, but help me get unstuck. Help me do what I've identified as my coping mechanism to help me get to a place where I can make that choice. And a lot of times it might just be, hey, we're, we've got all the, we're gonna go look at some information. We'll give you a call later this afternoon or tomorrow with our choice, right? And then communicating or implementing my choice. Help me express my choice. And I put a little asterisk by this because if the person's not present while um, somebody is helping them express their choice, then you may need another document like a, a power of attorney document to help allow somebody to express their choice when they're not present. Um, but if I have communication difficulties or if I get stuck, um, help me communicate my choice. Help me to understand what I need to do next. I've made a choice, now what? Who do I need to communicate this choice to? And then observing the results, support the choice I've made, right? Nothing's worse than going through making a decision and having everybody um, not support the decision that you've made. So good or bad, if there are bad consequences, we've all been there. We've all made mistakes that have blown up in our face and we've all made choices that we thought were initially good that just went wrong. Help me learn from that and move on, right? So one of the great things about supported decision-making is that this can really be used by anyone. The principles of supported decision-making, like I said with the example with my husband, it's really how a lot of us make decisions already. And while this concept really started with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, it can be used for any disability or condition, including, including those with mental health issues, those recovering from addictions, those with conditions of aging, right? We as human beings naturally go through this process when we're seeking out support to make decisions, right? It can even be used by people who are currently under a guardianship as a way to help build those decision-making skills. In Indiana, the law allows for a guardian to grant authority to the person under guardianship to allow them to use supported decision-making. And that can be a really powerful tool to help them build decision-making skills so that eventually they may not need that full-blown guardianship anymore, right? So there's lots of ways that it can be used. So another hard question that I get is, you know, oh, I know someone who would, this would be great for, but they don't have any family, they don't have any people in their life. So let's talk about how to help people who are quote unquote without supporters. Um, it really, you know, it might take some creativity. If the person doesn't have people readily identifiable to serve in the role of a supporter, 
you want to, you know, maybe think of either former service providers, former teachers or neighbors, parents of their friends. Um, there's some cool research being done in Alaska about peer-based decision-making and crowdsourced decision-making where their fellow peers with disabilities will help them, you know, make those decisions. They'll act as sounding boards. There's, um, in Alaska, they're building a really cool app where somebody can kind of type in a question or ask a question and the group will, um, the group will give feedback kind of an almost instantaneous. So there's really ways, um, to help build those opportunities. The other way is to look for meaningful opportunities for that person to develop those relationships. Um, looking outside of just their disability service um, sphere, you know, does the person like bowling? Help them join a bowling league. Um, do they like reading? Help them join a book club at the library. Maybe they can make some connections that way, right? Um, and finally, there may be a need to use other options like a power of attorney or a limited guardianship while that person is building their support network, right? But the point is we really want to start out with that least restrictive option first before we jump to um, something like guardianship, which we'll talk about in a moment, can be very difficult and costly to undo. So we've really talked about how the, the concept of supported decision making is what we inherently do anyway when we're making decisions, right? And when you're deciding, you know, what kind of car to buy, do you write down, you know, oh, I'm going to consult Kelly Blue Book and Consumer Reports. I'm going to talk to my brother and my uncle, and I'm going to visit these four dealerships. No, you just kind of get it in your head and you do it, right? Um, but for those who need some additional support or they need that structure, that might be a necessary tool. So these agreements not only provide a reference point for the person who needs that support to remind them, oh yeah, hey, this is my support system that I can use to really do that. But it also provides structure to the supporter to allow them to better understand how they can support the person. Um, and then most importantly, it can be used to show third parties like doctors or service providers who might be questioning somebody's ability to provide consent, that they are in fact able to make that decision and have that decision be recognized even if they are using accommodations in that process, right? And so the new law in Indiana really uh, now has legal recognition for the, the way the, um, the uh, agreements can be recognized. And I, don't, I won't go into the entire statute for you. If you are interested, Indiana Disability Rights has a tremendous number of resources about supported decision-making agreements, including templates, um, on our website, you are more than welcome to download those or email me. I'm happy to send them to you. Um, so uh, one of the other things that I wanted to just make it known briefly is that there is third party protection for relying on or declining to honor supported decision making. And then there's protection from liability for supporters because one of the fee one of the early feedback we said, well, you know, if I'm a supporter and I help the person make uh, a decision and that decision turns out to be wrong, can they come back and, and sue me for it or, or get me in trouble for it? And so there is protection in the law from liability for supporters, except in cases of fraud, misrepresentation, recklessness, or willful or wanton misconduct. And if anybody has examples of wanton misconduct, I would love to know it because it sounds um, really fun. But so here's an example. So let's say I come to my, my mom as my supporter. Lynn is a beautiful human being. She would be a fantastic supporter. But let's say I come to my mom as a supporter and I say, you know, um, my accessible van is really, um, it's starting to break down. I really think I need to buy a new one, right? And let's say my mom, and again, don't hold this against Linda. She would never do this in real life. But let's say my mom says, oh, you know, I happen to know of this guy who's selling an accessible van. Uh, I'll help connect you, right? And little do I know that Linda has engaged with this person to get a kickback for the sale and, and the car's a lemon and she knows it, right? That might be an example of, of fraud or misrepresentation or, or a place where a supporter could potentially face some liability, right? Because, and again, my mom's wonderful, beautiful. If you ever get the chance to know her, she would never do this in person. But if uh, they steered me in a direction where they knowingly knew that the, um, that the, you know, the product was bad or that it was a, a, a wrong um, choice or decision. So um, one of the other things to note is there's really no special form needed. In some other states, there's a required form 
um, not in Indiana. We do have, like I said, a form available on our website if people want a template to start from. Um, there are common components of a form where there's some general background information and acknowledgement by the adult. There's a description of the areas where they uh, where support is needed. There could be incorporation or reference to other documents. For example, if they have a trustee, uh, if they have a trust account, or if they have um, a representative payee relationship or some other type of relationship that they want to reference. Uh, there's a list of supporters. And then um, when the person signs it, it's got to be notarized. And then we have what's called a supporter appointment addendum where the supporter basically signs saying they acknowledge their roles and responsibilities. And what we really advocate for is what's called proactive implementation. So um, because people say, you know, do I have to carry this around with me? No. But if you know of places where you're likely to encounter decisions that are going to require or that may be challenged, um, for example, at your doctor's office or something like that, um, we advocate for what's called proactive implementation, where you would give a copy to your doctor and say, hey, in these instances, I'm using my supporters. This is how it's going to work. That way you know um, what's happening. In that way, if you are in somewhat of an emergency situation, you don't have to worry about it um, having to pull it off. You can also take pictures of the document, leave it on your phone, um, so that way you can pull it up if you need to reference it without having to carry around a whole document, right? But again, there's no special form needed. So however the, the, it works for you um, is, is perfectly fine. Um, there we go. Uh, so now let's talk about agency agreements, and these differ in that the person grants decision-making authority to someone else. That's still in that um, yellow category, right? Um, so in agency agreements, the person has the capacity to appoint someone else to act or make decisions on their behalf. Um, there's a lot of different forms of this. You typically think about it with powers of attorney, healthcare representative, representative payees. And they can really be written to address any number of circumstances. They are flexible, they're very well regulated in the law, um, they can be really useful, and they're, they're just generally part of good uh, advanced planning. The person can revoke them if they don't like the way that the person is making decisions on their behalf. Um, and so the difference between um, supported decision making and, and agency agreements is one major one. So in supported decision making, the person retains the decision making authority. They make that final decision. In power of attorney agreements, I am giving you, you know, the ability to make that decision on my behalf, right? Um, I would, you know, strongly encourage anybody to consult with an attorney who practices in this area to make sure that the documents are written with both the um, person's wishes and in compliance with the law. Right. So ne let's next let's talk about the final category, that red category. And um, again, these are things that um, a court needs to get involved with to help assist with the decision making. So first, we've got protective orders. These are way for a court to ratify or approve a specific event without needing to appoint a guardian. So, for example, you might see this if somebody with a disability inherits property and they need to dispose of it rather quickly. Well, this is really the only big major um, decision that they need to make. And so a court could say, hey, we're going to allow the sale of this property if the bank is um, questioning the person's ability to consent to the transfer or something like that. The court can ratify that event, that transfer of property, that disposition of property um, without needing to appoint a guardian to for the rest of the person's life in order to just effectuate that single transfer, that single decision. So that can be a strategy. Another one is um, obviously guardianship. And guardianships are a legal process. There are different types, but I wanna be very clear about what it is. There are considerable rights removed from the person as the guardian essentially stands in the legal shoes of the protected person. And this really should be used only when a person can no longer make or communicate decisions about their life or their property. It is absolutely a necessary tool. That's why I talk about it. But for those who don't need that high level of intervention, we want to talk about using some less restrictive ways to provide that support. So there are temporary guardianships where a court can grant decision making authority to someone for a limited amount of time, 90 days with a four cause extension for an additional 90 days. Um, you might see these in emergency situations, um, possibly if somebody needs to get into or out of a facility for treatment. 
um, or if there's an emergency that's, that's going to lead to a longer term uh, need for a full-blown guardianship. There's also limited guardianships where a person retains decision-making authority in all other areas not covered by the guardianship. So you might see these where um, there is a um, guardianship of the person, which generally covers medical treatment, um, where they live, that type of thing. And then there's guardianship of the estate, which deals with property and assets. In other states, you might hear these referred to as conservatorships. Um, and again, in the, the guardian makes decisions in only those areas covered by that guardianship. Now there's pluses and minuses about the implementation of, of limited guardianships and how they're perceived to outside um, people, but that is an option, right? And then finally, there's full or what's called plenary guardianship. And that means that all decisions are made by the guardian. And um, I wanna talk really quickly about why we want to start with less restrictive options and move up towards guardianship rather than starting with guardianship and moving back. And it's that they are really difficult and costly and resource heavy to terminate. There's only two ways that you can terminate a guardianship. One is death of the person under guardianship. Death of the guardian does not terminate the guardianship. The court will look to either successor guardian or they'll put a stranger guardian in place while they sort things out. So death of the person under guardianship, or you have to prove um, by clear and convincing evidence that the person no longer meets the definition of incapacity under Indiana law. So this involves getting medical experts, having um, people testify as to their functional skills. It could be um, very costly and time consuming to help get out from under an unnecessary guardianship. So again, we want to be very careful before we jump to that route. And I just want to know briefly that there are tons of other supports out there. Um, there's tons of other decision making models and depending on the circumstances, there are ways to address concerns with finances or healthcare specifically through things like trust accounts. There's shared decision making models or team based decision making models. Um, where the decision is kind of made by consensus and coordination with others. You might often think of this with, you know, treatment planning or, um, you know, case conference type situations. There's um, a push for shared decision-making in the medical field to help promote some more informed consent. There's also other decision-making support arrangements. There's advanced directives, psychiatric advanced directives, living wills, financial asset management, all kinds of other things. Um, and so people are really encouraged to talk to an attorney who specializes in this area of the law, <clears throat> excuse me, so that they can discuss all the different options that are available um, and to, to meet the needs that they have. The other thing that I want to note is, again, the concept of supported decision making, of accommodating and supporting someone to be able to make the decision themselves, can really and should be used throughout any of these other options. Um, like I said, even under the guardianship concept context, it can be a way for the person to gain skills in decision making, which could lead to less of a need for a guardian, right? And just to kind of give you um, an example, I want to focus briefly here on the difference between um, supported decision-making, power of attorney, and guardianship, because those are kind of the, the clearest um, groups that, that tend to get confused. And so here's an example. So this is Diana. Diana has schizophrenia. She lives alone. She's retired. Her adult son, Greg, helps her around the house, helps her if anything major comes up, right? So Diana slipped on some wet tile a few weeks ago. She's having terrible knee pain. So Greg goes with her to you know, the orthopedic doctor's office to get it looked at. And the doctor says, you know, Diana, you have a tear and a ligament in your knee. And so the treatment is either you know, steroid shots and regular physical therapy or surgery, right? Neither treatment uh, option sounds desirable to Diana. It's causing her a great deal of anxiety, whether because of her diagnosis of schizophrenia, her age, her behavior in the office, the presence of her son, what have you, the doctor begins to question Diana's ability to make uh, a choice or consent to a certain course of treatment, right? So under supported decision-making, if Diane had her son as a supporter, she would be able to use his support in that context to help her make the decision. Um, the process which would be written down in her uh, agreement would allow the doctor to better understand how she has made that decision and to recognize the use of her son as a support as a valid way for her to demonstrate medical informed consent. Under a power of attorney, if Diane had previously you know, executed a, a power of attorney document naming her son as attorney in fact for medical decisions, that doctor could look to Greg 
to make the decision on his mom's behalf in accordance with the language of the POA. Um, hopefully Greg would make the decision based on Diana's wishes. If Diana did not like the way that Greg made that decision, she could revoke that power of attorney um, and move on her merry way. Um, under guardianship, if Greg had been appointed guardian, the doctor would look exclusively to Greg to make a decision about which treatment to do. So if you think about it, supported decision-making, I make the decisions myself using my supporter. Power of attorney is I appoint you to make decisions for me. And then guardianship is a court has appointed you to make decisions for me. So you can kind of see those different distinctions. Oh, so what protections are in place? One of the biggest questions I hear about supported decision-making is what protections are in place to keep people from making bad decisions, right? Um, or from, you know, keep them from being abused, neglected, or exploited. And that's absolutely important. So I wanna make sure to talk about um, some of those concerns. So there is this presumption of capacity that happens magically on a person's 18th birthday, where the state says, congratulations, you're now an adult, right? Um, no, I don't know about you, but there is nothing magic that happens overnight where you wake up suddenly being a functional adult. I'm in my late 30s and I still don't always feel like I have a handle on things. Um, and here's kind of an example. So recall, recall that I am at best an adequate, adequate driver. Well, in college where we all know great decisions are made, I decided to test fate one day by seeing how long I could go with my uh, tank on E. You know, it didn't start out that way. I was running late for class. Uh, I didn't have time to stop and I was in a hurry to get home, but it went like two or three days with that needle just pushing the E. You know, finally off campus on my way home, my car died, right? Um, so what should have been an, a $20 fill up a couple of days ago turned into a $75 tow to a gas station, a $20 fill up and a really embarrassing phone call to my parents, right? Now, after this incident, the state didn't take away my license. They didn't say that I can't drive anymore. They didn't put me under guardianship for making a crappy decision. Um, they didn't condition my driving on always, you know, having over half a tank. No, I was able to learn from my mistake and move on, right? And knock on wood to this day, I have yet to run out of gas again. I learned my lesson. And that's the presumption of capacity. That's having dignity of risk. And unfortunately, people with disabilities are often not given that same dignity to make mistakes. And they may find themselves in a position where their ability to make decisions is questioned for, you know, bad choices that many of us have also made, right? Um, so in, here's kind of another example. So my dad has smoked a pipe his entire life. It's gross. I don't agree with it. It's unhealthy. It's expensive. My sister and I constantly told him, stop smoking, right? You're making, but no one has ever said, you know, you're making an unhealthy choice that a reasonable person wouldn't make. So I'm going to get guardianship over you because it's clear you can't make healthy decisions. No, that's not how, how it works, right? That's silly. But often people with disabilities are held to this higher standard. They don't get that dignity of risk that my dad enjoys. They don't have their choices respected automatically by doctors or service providers. Um, you know, presumption of capacity and dignity of risk is what allows us as adults to eat cake for dinner and to not take our antibiotics as prescribed and to not work out and eat healthy like we know we should, um, to not wear bike helmets. It's what allows us to rack up debt and date the wrong people and do all the things that make life life, right? And, and we are not punished well, sometimes we are, but we are not punished by the state for the decisions that we make for the most part. And this burden of low expectations is that we assume that people with disabilities either won't make good decisions or they don't know how to make decisions. And so we don't even give them opportunities to do so. And then we're surprised when they make a quote unquote bad decision and we have this knee jerk reaction like, well, that didn't work and they can never make another decision again. It's not how we treat the general populace. It's not how we should treat people with disabilities. None of us would want our decision-making skills judged for the rest of our life by what we did at age 19, right? Um, and people with disabilities deserve that same presumption of capacity, that same dignity of risk that we all enjoy. We all um, learn by, uh, from the bad choices that we make in life, and people with disabilities are, are no exception. Here's another secret. Guardianship is not an impenetrable shield. It is not a chastity belt. It is not a bank vault. It will not slap a cookie out of a diabetic's hand. It will not force somebody to take medications. It will not keep somebody from walking out the door of a facility. Bad things can and do happen. It's unfortunately part of the world we live in. There is no guarantee of safety under any arrangement, but that's not the reason to limit the options available to people with disabilities to live their best lives, right? Instead, people with disabilities should be empowered to use their voice, 
have their voices respected. So that means if abuse, neglect, or exploitation does occur, um, having their stories believed and then holding the perpetrators accountable. It's much better to teach someone how to identify toxic, abusive, or exploitive behavior than to rely on someone always being around to do that for them because eventually they either won't have a person in their corner or worse yet, they may have the wrong person in their corner. And there has been research to suggest that the more a person feels empowered, the more self-determination they have, the more likely they are to avoid abuse, neglect, and exploitation or recognize it when it does happen and be able to seek help to remedy that situation. And lastly, I would remind everybody that Indiana is a mandatory reporting state. There are reporting requirements for anybody who becomes aware of abuse, neglect, or exploitation of a vulnerable adult or child. Um, and so that reporting is required, right? Okay, so how do we support these options? I've, I've, I want to do this. I want to, you know, not just jump to guardianship. I want to talk about all these, these different things. So how do we get started using supported decision-making or some of these other less restrictive options? So let's break down the process a little bit. For people currently under guardianship who want to move to a less restrictive option, your first step is to an attorney. You can contact Indiana Disability Rights. You can contact Indiana Legal Services. Um, there might be some other legal assistance available as well. But in order to get out from under guardianship, you're going to need an attorney, right? Because um, that's a court process. And it's a very complicated and costly court process. For those who are not under guardianship, here's how you do it. So you wanna learn about those options, right? Um, Indiana Disability Rights offers options counseling where we'll talk to you about what different options are. The SILs, the Centers for Independent Living, are also a great resource for information about what options are available. The ARC of Indiana, um, there's all kinds of different groups out there. Um, Indiana Disability Rights has a great website with a lot of resources to get you started on those conversations. And then um, help the person assess their strengths and their needs. So we have what we use, which is a person-driven support worksheet and a support assessment. So the person-driven support worksheet is something that the person fills out themselves, where they think about the areas of their life where they feel like they need support, um, where their strengths are, and then their caregivers or other support systems fill out the support assessment, asking fairly similar things. You look to see where they, um, they match and where they differ, and you use that as a starting point to start the discussion about how that person wants the support to be given. And again, the person is the center of this discussion, right? It's what supports they feel they need, how they want to be supported, um, how they want assistance making decisions, right? And then you wanna start thinking about who are the people in that person's life that could be potential supporters. When we think about qualities for a circle of support, for some, they've gotta be over 18 if they're gonna serve as an attorney in fact, um, or as a supporter. You want to look at the person's stated trust and preference, you know, um, siblings, cousins, friends, family that they've known forever, um, length of time that the person has known them, their relationship with that person. Are they likely to agree with or honor the person's choices? Or are they going to step in and try and force their choice? Are they available? You know, their, their sibling um, who's away in college may be a great choice for them, but are they going to be readily accessible if that person needs to make decisions, right? Are they able to provide the support in a stated way? If I want my supporter to come with me to medical appointments, but not say anything, just be there to help get information, take notes while I'm in there. If my supporter starts talking and asking questions and taking over, they're not providing that support in the way that I've, I've stated that I want it, right? Um, suitability, and with this, we talk about not only the person's expertise, but also their character, criminal background, their observed influence over the person, that type of thing. Um, are there secondary additional or backup people? Are there new relationships that are forming that we want to kind of help support this type of, of a relationship? So um, the other things that we want to do, go over the assessments with the supporters, make sure that they understand how that support is to be given, and then start to develop a plan or decide on the options. Again, this is person directed. So the person talks about what supports and they may say, you know, in finances, I'm really not comfortable yet, so I want a, a power of attorney document to give a little bit more, more force, a little bit more support and security in that area. Healthcare, I'm fine. I, I don't need as much support. I, I just want this, you know, my sister to serve in that role, right? And then you want to write out that plan. Again, we've got a, a supported decision-making agreement template. You can also consult with an attorney who can help write a plan or draft other necessary documents um, to go forward with that. So um, 
then you want to have the supporters sign the consents uh, or sign the document in the presence of a notary if you're doing a supported decision making agreement or a power of attorney. And then again, like I talked about earlier, that proactive implementation, um, share it with regular providers, have it available or handy if you need it. Um, I want to encourage you to check out, I, I see we're running close to time, so um, I want to encourage you to look at free to be. There's a link to it on our Indiana Disability Rights website. It's uh, a chronicle of Jamie Beck's life and how she went from under guardianship to using a supported decision-making agreement. Um, and Jamie is a fantastic self-advocate. She would be happy to talk to people who are curious about how it works functionally, how she uses her supported de decision-making agreement, things like that. Um, so how to help. You can help somebody understand how they like to help to make decisions. So pay attention when they make decisions. Help them try to figure out their style. Help them seek out supporters who match that style, right? Um, help them break down the decision into smaller parts. Where do they need help? Where do they need that strength and support? What tools or strategies can I use to help them? What has been successful in the past, right? Um, one of the biggest things you can do is talk about options early and often. Don't wait until the person is on the night before their 18th birthday to bring this up. Start talking about it as early as you can. Um, encouraging opportunities for decision making. If you still have you know, a school-aged child, build decision making skills into their curriculum, into their, um, into their IEP goals, into their you know, um, services and support plans. Give them opportunities for increasingly more complex decision making. I can't tell you how many times I've seen services and support plans where the goal is, you know, Johnny's gonna order lunch from McDonald's. Well, guess what? Johnny's been ordering lunch from McDonald's for five years now. Let's up the ante. Let's give him more complex decisions to do, right? Um, be a supporter, uh, formally or informally. And then referring to resources. Indiana Disability Rights, like I said, that's a link to our, our website for, um, uh, great resources to get started. There's some other great ones that I want to point you to. You can also feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to share these slides uh, and make them available, but you can also get to them through our, our website. That is my direct contact information. You're, you're more than welcome to email me or give me a call. And with that, I think uh, I have left like three minutes for um, any type of Questions or anything like that? I don't, do I need to unshare or? Um, it's up to you. It's totally up to you. We do have a question in the chat box that you kind okay. of touched on there right at the end. Um, but the question was, how do you start this as the child is young and as, as it's my goal to make her or to make this her norm and her culture? So this particular mom has a, a fairly young little mm -hmm. Down syndrome so yes so and I do this I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old and I have you know as many times as possible I talk about the importance of having control over your own life and your decisions and we start out small you know you can start off with things like forced choices where it's um, you know um, you can decide what you want for snack and then you support them great here's your snack and then you can increasingly build more complex decisions in opportunities and scenarios where they are protected from, from risk, right? Um, giving them pocket change and having them budget for something that they may wanna buy. We are big fans of the dollar bins at Target. You know, okay, here, you have one or you have $2. Go through and, and figure out what you wanna buy with your money. And, you know, teaching, you know, oh, well, I really want this Paw Patrol notebook but it's $3, oh, okay, well then you need to save for it for next time or something like that. So there's ways that you can informally build and support decision-making. I would also encourage people to demand it from their school, make sure that it's in IEP goals and that it's meaningful in IEP goals. And the sooner you can involve your child in the IEP process, the better. I know everybody talks about 14 being that magical age, but to the extent they can be involved um, earlier in that process, giving them control and input into the goals that they have or the direction that they want to take, the better, right? Um, so again, lots of opportunities early and often for decision making and then supporting. I can't tell you how, how dejecting it can be when you make a decision and something goes wrong, which has happened to all of us, and then somebody says, well, I told you so, or well, you're not ready for that type of decision. 
helping them learn because that again is part of that decision making process is dealing with the consequences and learning from that and moving on. So um, yeah, it takes time. Um, it's something that I've encouraged you know, people with and without disabilities. I think everybody needs more, more education and training and decision making skills, but the more opportunities that you can build into to um, make decisions, the better. And as parents, I get it, it's hard. It's so much easier sometimes to just be like, this is what you're doing, this is what you're wearing. But, um, you know, sometimes you just kind of, you know, you have to let go a little bit and, and let them make decisions. And sometimes that means wearing shorts when it's 60 degrees out, you know, because then they learn, you know, it's not what I pick out to wear um, may have impacts on my, my life, my, the rest of my day, that type of thing. So. Excellent. And I just, I wanted to read a comment. Um, in response to that question, a dad said, one suggestion is to involve your child and let them have input at doctor's appointments, IEPs, mm -hmm. et cetera. Start with letting them answer questions. Sorry about my child. You're fine. <laughs> He's laughing hysterically. Um, and then another person asked to get a copy of the PowerPoint slides so that she could share with her coworkers. And Melissa, if you would be willing to send that to Absolutely. me, can forward yep. it to all the attendees, if that would work. Mm -hmm. And don't Happy forget to. that this has been recorded. So I will, in addition to sending you the slides, I can also send you a link to the webinar so that you can send that to friends and coworkers so that they can watch as well. Any other questions anyone wants to ask? It looks like there's some other, there's a comment. Okay, so um, one of the questions was, uh, do we do this before the person turns 18? So, and like I said, legally speaking, once a child turns 18, they have the ability to make their decisions um, from a legal perspective. They, they, are fully functioning adults under these the laws of the eyes of the state. Now, like I've said, you know, supported decision making is a lot what we do anyway. So it's perfectly fine to start building that supported decision making agreement before the person turns 18, right? Um, from a legal perspective as to whether or not they can legally sign, you have to wait until they're 18. But as long as they are um, functionally using it, there's no reason why you can't start that process early. Right, um, you know, whether it's informally or formally. So thank you guys very much for having me. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. If anybody thinks of other questions, please feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to help in any way that I can and uh, enjoy the, the rest of your conference and thank you so much. Well, thank you, Melissa. That was wonderful and so informative. We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I will send you the, the slides. Thank you guys. All right.